And we're back. So I'm Robert Tursik, and I'll be your moderator this afternoon. Um, we're, we're here to talk about how the interactive experience can drive engagement as well as innovation for the TV programming. And I've got two excellent guests here for, me, uh, for us today. Uh, Lisa Shaw is coming to us. She's the executive vice president from Bravo in the United States, and they've had tremendous experience with social media, and she's going to tell us all about that. And we also have Nathan Gunn. Nathan is the founder of a company called Social Game Universe, and he's extremely knowledgeable about how social media can drive broadcast viewership and drive the audience, because he actually has the experience from, from City TV, a super innovative programmer in Toronto. So we're delighted to have you both here today. Thank you very much for making the trip you, across Mark. the Atlantic to join us. Uh, you know, I wanted to start today with, with Lisa. If you could tell me a little bit about your experience early on at Bravo, because Bravo was one of the first channels to actually do anything with social media. And so you started out with basically letting people talk about the show. Yeah. Um, I came from news, and so I w really wasn't f familiar with um, Bravo's a, a cable entertainment network, which primarily does reality programming. So I wasn't quite familiar how passionate and engaged the fans get, as well as the fact that the audience tends to be really tech savvy. What I find is if you follow them, they tend to be way ahead of us. And this started, I would say, seven years ago with a show called Project Runway. And so we just allowed them to vote and say, who do you think should win Project Runway? And I, I, you know, I barely knew what an SMS message was, and literally, the, I, I, hundreds of thousands of people voted the first time. I was like, wow. So that sort of keyed me into that as social grew, that there was really an opportunity there. So three years ago, uh, when basically Twitter was just getting some traction, we had people tweet along with the shows. And I saw it was happening. I said, why don't we combine Facebook and Twitter uh, into a social two-screen experience and have the talent engage with people who are watching the show? So we were the first TV network to combine Facebook and Twitter to create what is now commonly referred to as social TV. And once again, the fans, it just took off. And since we were early movers in the space, we found that it really moved the, the, the honor ratings as well. So I really believe that social can drive scale. Um, and then when the iPad came out, we had a similar sort of thinking, which was we were the first network to come out to create a two-screen companion uh, co-viewing app so that as you watch the show, you had the iPad in your lap and you had content pushed to you exclusively as well as had the social experience. Um, and you know that also had a phenomenal response. I think technology is really moving quickly. So in Europe, you have ZBox, which I think is an amazing technology. So I just think you know things are moving really quickly, and uh, it's amazing how in the space of just two or three years, how advanced socials become. How did you present this? So let, let's take the example of um, it's the talk bubble, right? That's, yeah. That was uh, that was how you described the social interaction using Twitter and Facebook. How did you present that to people? Because that was an entirely new concept at the time. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You just, to a certain extent, you just have to throw it up there. It's not like you can explain to them, this is the talk bubble, and this is what you do. So you didn't get burning, like, things on the show Oh, oh no, we totally, or... well, we, we did, but oh. you can't, you know, you, all you can say is participate in the talk bubble, talk with the oh, okay. talent now, you know, log on to Facebook and Twitter. And, and, and where would they go? They would go to the webpage to find out more? They could go to the web, more. mobile, and then, you know, what I usually find is, uh, people adopt to things very quickly. So mm -hmm. you're, you were following the behavior since people were tweeting and, and posting already anyway. They, the adoption took up right away. Now, with the, I, uh, with the iPad when it came out, in the beginning, it was simply limited by the scale of the iPad. But that's quickly proliferated. And of course, smartphones are proliferated. So now the application is, you know, Bravo yeah, the now apps, is people, available people everywhere. People seem to be able to find apps. But you know, we had this example just a little while ago. There's a speaker from Twitter, and he showed some video of newscasters using the kind of ungainly jargon of Twitter, you know, saying, like, use this hashtag. Yeah. Here. And, so, and it's, a, it's a mouthful for a yeah. TV <laughs> announcer to try to get in. And also, it's a little awkward to try to explain social media in a broadcast show. So I'm always curious to find out how, how broadcasters do it. Do you get support from the, from the promo people? Are they into it? Do they help you? It, it's evolved over time. <laughs> That's a very polite <laughs> because way of putting it. Just like with the Real Housewives, which is one of our franchises, uh, they had to learn it as well. Yeah. So, uh, but then you build an incentive. So for the talent, for instance, with the Real Housewives, when we first started like three years ago, most of them didn't know how to tweet. So I just decided we should just put the leaderboard at the bottom with all five of them and how many followers they had. And that incented them to 
tweet more. That's really smart. <laughs> yeah. That is so smart. That's the best idea that yeah, I've heard. Some of the all simple ideas day. have the most effect. Right on. Yeah. Just sheer pride. And then, yeah. then, then they themselves realized it was benefiting their brand yes, as well. Yes, of course. So. Right on. Oh, that's really cool. But I would say the bottom line is you, you have to keep the messaging simple. That's one of the cha challenges we have. And if you watch any young person with a smartphone, they're not following an instruction book. Right. They're doing it on their own. Right on. Okay, yeah, th these are experiential technologies, so the only way to learn to do them is to jump right in. Now, you've also launched the Transmedia app for Top Chef. And yes. I would love to hear more about this because there's been a lot of talk about Transmedia. It's a topic that seems to come up every single year. Tell us a little bit about what you've done and how, how that worked out. Um, well, this really came from my own frustration that I felt that the digital video we're getting was like bonus extras, you know, things that they left on the cutting room floor and that what we got really wasn't meaningful. So I was bound and determined that we, were try we had to create some sort of digital video that was meaningful. So on Top Chef, which is a competition reality show around food, uh, when, the con when the contestant was eliminated, they went back to the sequestered house where they have to sort of sit for a while so that no one knows that they were eliminated. They found out they were actually going to compete in a companion digital series to get back on the show. So suddenly you had something that mattered. So at the end of the show, it would say, if you know, Robert got kicked off, you'd say, want to find out what, how Robert contends? Go to bravotv.com. So then you could go on you know, any platform, mobile, tap, applets, download on demand, and watch the series. I had absolutely no idea how it was going to do. It was very much like this experiment with uh, creating a, a social TV uh, experience. So we just, and again, we had to keep the messaging simple. So instead right. of trying to throw them to all the platforms, we just threw them to the web and see what happened. So I expected, at best, that we would maybe get a million streams. We had not ever gotten on a video series anyone close to a million streams. So in the end, we got over 8 million streams over 12 wow. weeks. Amazing and uh, it's the highest streamed um, series in all of NBC Universal's history. And, uh, you know, I think it doesn't, it, it, I, I don't know compared to other networks, but I'd say it's up there. And um, I think our learning was that 20%, 26% of the on air TV watching audience was watching Last Chance Kitchen as it evolved. And that is really impressive. It, it's, so the numbers are qu they're the quite high. Powerful engagement numbers. And, and so the highest rated episode of the on-air episode was when the Last Chance Kitchen digital series winner went back on and oh, they cool. got the big surprise like, oh. oh and so it was not someone that was actually beloved by them and they weren't happy. Uh, but you could, so you could show to the programming department that the web audience actually came back to television, which is what they're always asking for, right? The, Correct. It seems to me in, in television, that's all the programmers care about with new media is can it drive ratings for the TV yes. show? Can you can you siphon the web audience and drive As them I back on to TV? You, we're growing all of our audience together. Right on. Yeah. Well, that's true. That's how the audience <laughs> experiences it. Right. They graze from platform to platform. Well, Nathan, you, you've been patiently sitting here as we chatted a little bit about Bravo, but I wanted to get that history under uh, before we got further into yeah, the conversation, because I think um, just about everybody in TV is struggling with this issue where. There's a new new media department or an inter internet department, and it's a little bit unclear whether that group is there for marketing purposes or usually they have a revenue target, so it's also a business, but are, are they a distribution platform? And the answer is they're a little bit of everything. Right. So it's a bit of an identity crisis, and they tend to be that group down the hall. Meanwhile, the TV people are focused on you know their TV responsibilities. Uh, so I think it's great to hear yeah. that Bravo has actually kind of figured out how to integrate the digital experience across all aspects. Really, production is involved in your shows. They're helping. Uh, you know, you're you're finding it. You're, you're bringing meaningful audience numbers uh, back to the programming, so they probably love it. I'm sure you have a revenue target that you have to hit. So the finance department is appreciative of that, no doubt. Now, Nathan, your focus is social games, but you have this history in television. Tell us a little right. bit about what brought you to starting sure. Social Game Universe and, and what the purpose of the company sure. is. Sure. Well, you know, it's interesting. When they handed me this clicker, I was thinking back to um, my old boss, Moses Neimer, who yeah. started City TV. Legendary. Yeah. We had interactive TV in 1991-92. I remember that was too much for much, and you voted with a clicker like this in a room while you watched the show, and you had to vote whether you thought it should go on air or not. And uh, I remember doing some interactive TV broadcasts where the audience would come right in through the front windows of the studio, and we had yeah, all sorts right of interesting on. experiments with that stuff. Right, it was like social so TV before there was anything social That's right. On the yeah, Speaker's Corner was another one. Yeah. You could put a Canadian dollar coin, Famous, which was a loony, yeah. into the thing, and you could record yourself, and it went to tape. That's it was what, low tech, that's high what, tech. That's what convinced Barry Diller to leave the TV business and go into the internet. I think you're right. I yeah. think you're right. In fact, Diller's been quoted as talking quite a bit about Moses' innovations in what the original interactive TV stuff. 
So that's where I, I kind of got my start and started the interactive division there and, and did a bunch of stuff, the first Grammys, webcasts, and those kinds of things. Um, but a passion of mine has always been games. And so over the years, I've done a variety of kinds of work for different broadcasters and film companies and so on. But in the mid-2000s, started focusing on one of my passions, which was games themselves as a content product. And so we've done that for the last few years. The last project we did is uh, Dirty Dancing with Lionsgate, which is a social game on Facebook. Cool. Um, but what's really interesting to me is the last, I'd say, six to 12 months, I have begun thinking again about the technologies and the work we've done there and how that can be brought back to the engagement question that you're talking about with broadcasters. So um, as you saw just before we started chatting, there's a couple of products that grow out of the game work that we're doing yeah. that we think kind of apply, and that, and that sort of new thinking. Uh, we know about these sort of gamification or rewards programs, but we, we talked before this as well mm -hmm. about some of the challenges that exist right in Well, we'll get into the gamification yeah. part in a minute, but you actually prepared some examples to share sure. with us. Right? Bruno, can we bring, bring up uh, Nathan's slides, please? So, so these are just some interesting stats. I think the, the main point of these slides is that uh, there's a there there in social games. It's pretty fascinating. Most of us by now have heard about it. A year and a half, two years ago, I was out talking about this and people, a lot of people didn't know. It's really important to, ex to sort of really understand this is a significant business and a significant content experience unto itself. Social games are played by over 100 million people in the States. Um, there's over, uh, I think, almost 300 million people play Zynga games, which yeah. is a big social game company. And, of course, some amazing stats that we're probably all used to now. 39 years is the average age. Women play more often than men. Uh, so pretty profound, and a lot of brands getting involved in this space. Um, this is just a quick slide. I want to say lots of games have actually got bigger audiences than primetime TV. So this is all just to get to the point of uh, there's a there there. One of the interesting observations I've, I've thought that's been made and that uh, speaks quite loudly to what we're talking about, uh, there's some funny stats here, for example, that there are more virtual tractors sold in Farmville, which is Zynga's leading game, than there are real tractors sold every year. But what's uh, really interesting, um, these numbers are actually a bit old, so you can double just about everything there. It says 200 million users uh, for Zynga, it's, uh, it's almost double that. Zynga's projected earn over 450 million in 2010. They actually came, uh, are headed for a billion dollars this year. Wow. Um, but what's really interesting is the CEO of that company says he's a marketer, not yeah. a game developer. And that's because they've taken all these learnings and lessons from the traditional marketing world and applied them to the social graph and used game, or game mechanics, playing with your friends, to actually drive that in a new way, in a new kind of recipe. But Zynga isn't profound. a company that will do business with a TV company. They're not interested. I spoke to them a couple of years ago. I said, hey, let's do a deal. And they said, you know, Hollywood, you guys move too slow, and right. you're too difficult to deal with, so we're building our own brands. Right. But you guys are taking a different approach, right? Social for sure, for sure. Well, we're not making a billion dollars in cash off of virtual tractors this year. So right. I, I, I actually am motivated to do other things. But I'm also quite passionate about content uh, in other realms being uh, developed for games. I mm -hmm. think there's a, a ton of potential there. So that's the dirty dancing stuff that we've been doing. Um, so so what, what problem did you solve here for Lionsgate? Well, you know, actually, uh, I think we solved the problem of how you begin to monetize some of your content in, in these other media. Right um, and so this is not meant to drive. I mean, as you said, at these companies, there's often two mandates. There's driving the traffic back mm -hmm. to the original source. But there's also making revenue. And so I think the question here was, what is this good for? And is it for driving traffic back or is it for making revenue? We, we mainly focused on driving revenue uh, okay. from the game. So we had over a million users in our beta period, um, and we, had, we generated about $18 per paying user. Yeah. So very successful for That's them in great. terms of learning that you can make money in this space. Mm -hmm. We also learned a ton of other interesting lessons, which includes the fact that you can't just rely on the audience you already have. They have 15 million fans on their Facebook fan pages. But those fans didn't monetize for us. I mean, very, very minimal monetization. So although we thought when we began this project that we were going to have a tremendous amount of revenue from those users, we did get traffic. They did help spread the word. But those were not the users who really spent money. The users who spend money are the people you go out and you buy through advertising that you target. As you know, the advertising on these systems is quite sophisticated. Wow. You'd say, That's I want great... women in this age group in Australia at this I, time of day. Is that because they're gamers and they're used to spending, basically? That's a great question because that's kind of the lesson that we learned here, which okay. was if, so if you advertised this game as Dirty Dancing, people would come in and some would stay and play and some would enjoy it. But if you advertise this game as a game, as a resort management game, and then you had the branding Dirty Dancing on it almost as a kind of validation that it would be a good game, the yeah. way you know, Michael Jordan might validate your Nike runners, yeah. but you right. don't buy Michael Jordan when you buy those runners. Right. So when we began selling it as a game, as opposed to the movie Dirty Dancing, we got way, way higher value users. Uh, so that was really a really interesting a powerful audience. lesson. Because mm. I'll tell you, most of the people on TV, they feel like, hey, our brand, that is the marketing mm. on the web. So 
they look at the internet department and say, if you can't make business using that brand, you guys are no good. You're right. done. But right. the fact is, there's got to be an additional marketing spend to reach the specific customer who you're going to be able to monetize. Right. That's right. a great lesson. By the way, most TV companies are giving it away on Facebook, right? right. Most TV companies are putting their content up there and right. they're hoping for the best. Right. And Facebook is a black hole for traffic. Con audience goes in, but it doesn't come back out. Right. It doesn't link right. through. You're not going to see meaningful lift on your own web destination if you're putting your content into Facebook. So you guys actually cracked the code on how a media company can make money leveraging an, an old brand, really, in this case, Dirty Dancing, and, not but, a new But brand. an evergreen brand, which is another great point, yeah, because yeah. You, you don't necessarily want a one-off brand. You want something that fans have shown they continually have interest in that they'll come back to, and you can, you know, it's not something that's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. In fact, speaking of the television analogy, Moses, and quoting him again, he says, TV is flow, not show. And I asked him one day what he meant by that, and he meant <laughs> it's not the one weekend box office, it's the ongoing process of having people in the studio uh, yeah. walking around. Well, social games are a lot like that. I often say now to people working with me, it's flow, not show. You iterate these games in an ongoing fashion. You change them every day based on what people are doing. And I don't know if you want to take a quick look, but I can show you that one of the questions the TV uh, and content folks I work with have is, well, this is a game. We don't know the space. It's so complicated. We don't know how to get into it. It's a mystery when we work with developers what's behind it. So we've made, we've tried to make, and hope other developers do this too, make it so that anybody can create and modify these things. We, I'll skip the stats on how you actually do this. These are some stats on how the game, our game is doing. Yeah. But getting those stats is really well, easy now because the game is running on a server. It's not a product we ship to stores and then wait to see if it was bought and see the reports every three months. It's something we look at in real time every day. Yeah. So that bottom right corner is our new user funnel. And we see as users drop out at each step in the game. And we can go in and change that if we need to. By the way, Lisa, do you have a dashboard like this too for your social media so you can see if you're getting lift, if you're getting traction? You certainly track the number of people we who do, are following. We, are, we, we, have a, we, we don't have a social game. I mean, mm -hmm. we are launching but I mean, for one your other in the social summer. Initiatives. Yeah, we do, but it's not... Um, I can't express how I believe that social media analytics are really in the stone age and that we have such a long way to go. I mean, a dashboard would be step one, mm -hmm. but um, you know, just really how to optimize your um, social media presence and when to post things in Facebook or how, how to maximize your social game. You know, um, it can only go uphill from here. I'll just well, put it that true. way. Yeah, it <laughs> but if you think about it, you, you, our, our data about our audience behavior for television is pretty crude. It's basically on or off. They're either watching or they're not <laughs> watching. So, and you don't get it that fast. You get it right. overnight if you're lucky, right? And, right? and usually many months later. One of the interesting things about dashboards like this is that you can see it right now. And you can change something and see if it changed. Right. Or you can A-B test so you can see, well, you know, if the green background, right. it's going to convert And the path of a user. Right. Right. That's what I'm particularly interested yeah, that's in. Sure. Yeah. What, and, what see what, and see what yeah. they like and don't like so that we can build more of that. And that's all instantly visible to us. So now, that, do, that's your, been do your colleagues in programming care about those stats? Do they pay attention? They must find it interesting to see. Uh, no, I, I don't think that. I mean, <laughs> okay. at this point, they're not that familiar. It's hard for them to understand. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, in fact, I just began uh, just this week. I, I gave our metrics because I'm making a big picture. Increasingly, the production people are seeing the value of what we do mm -hmm. because it's starting to affect their ratings. Um, and so they asked me to you know, give them our, a report, our, our report. So we yeah. gave them to them and they started calling me. This is really complicated, yeah. you know, because Welcome it's everything. To our world. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it, it, it's the it's the beginning of the education across all platforms. Very cool. I, I interrupted you, so please. No, proceed. that's fine. You know, I didn't want to spend too long on it, but these are the tools that we're trying to make so that it's a turnkey kind of tool set for making these social games and doing the kind of stuff that works in these social games, so that it's not a big black mysterious box to a right. content company. We want to open that up, democratize that. You can think of this as a content management system for games. I can also see my users where they're stuck, uh, what items they have. I can address Very their cool. needs if they have problems. Very cool. So your proposition to a TV company would be one producer can run this entire experience and they don't have to develop any kind of code at all because you handle that all right. for them. Right, and you're not stuck in vendor lock. You can go in and, you know, as I said, it's a CMS, so you can yeah. upload new content, new video content, new characters, new, new storylines cool. without having to have a programmer do that. For, do you I, produce the content? Do you, will you produce the new well, characters? Well, obviously we do that now, yeah. and, and so we're not quite at the day and age where, the, as you say, the TV company is going to totally take over that stuff because not everybody understands it all fully, but mm -hmm. we think that day is coming. In the meantime, we kind of do a hybrid solution cool. where we create it. And how do you get paid? Who, how do they pay you for that? So usually we get paid for the actual production 
production of the product. We don't take a profit if we have a revenue share. We don't take a profit on the production costs. Um, we get just the hard costs of producing the content, and then we take a revenue share on, on the back end. And I think that's a great model because we remain very, very motivated in the product, and as I said, it's flow, not show. So we stay with that product so, month after month after month, making sure that it gets better and better and better. I don't look at these games as something you throw up and tell how, it, how it's doing in three months and decide to take it down or not. I look at these as things that should be there five years from now, seven years from now. Wow. That's my belief. Very cool. And how many companies can you support at one time? Let's suppose you got a flood of interest from different companies. Well, that would be, that would be a great problem to have. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think at this time, my studio can handle about five projects at a time. Very so, cool. Yeah. I think okay. TV producers would be shocked since we're in the middle of doing a social game how much it costs to maintain a game every month. Right. I mean, it's a huge... You're really literally refreshing. It's not like something you just throw up there and go, oh, go have play and have a good time. That's a great That's point. That's exactly right. That's right. It's programming. That's the other side of the flow, not show, is it's not a one-off. You really want to keep it alive with new content. Hopefully, if you design the game well enough, a lot of the new content is what the players are doing to each other. And that's a, a key to kind of keeping costs down, is making sure that yeah. they can do interesting things to each other, and that keeps it fresh, too. Well, it's actually the key to good interactive design, is right. that my interaction changes your experience, and we both find that meaningful in some way. Not, you know, that my interaction doesn't disrupt your experience in a bad way, but it actually makes it better in some, somehow. Right. Right. Lisa, tell me, when you see a pitch like this, I'm sure you see them all the time, what's your reaction? So here you are, you represent this incredibly powerful brand in TV, and also one that's known for for kind of being on the leading edge mm -hmm. of social experiences, do you think your audience is ready for social games? Well, our, <laughs> once again, our audience is already there. Okay. So my job is how to um, maintain somewhat of our brand, because, you know, of course, the, the brand people are going to say, like, oh, it has to be exactly this way, and my battle is have to work with the, you know, the game developers who are going to say, well, if you want your game to be successful, maybe you shouldn't cling so hard to what your brand is. And then my point of view is also, you know, I'm, I'm trying to build engagement. What I'm really trying to do is monetize. Mm -hmm. So I have to say, we TV people are not experts in social gaming. So I really think you have to have a partner in there and respect them oh, cool. and their guidance. But that's, I would that's say... That's fantastic it, to but, hear. But that is a little <laughs> bit of a catch-22 because their point of view is very different from the TV person's right. point so of view. There's a little bit of socialization well, you just don't that want, to You happen. don't want to, like, compromise yourself into not making money. Right. Oh, I see your point. Yeah. Right on. But it's a good pro. Uh, it, you know, I, I, the arrangement you propose, I can see that you align the incentives the right way, so right. that you're going to be really learning as much as you can about what makes that TV company tick and and what appeals to their audience. You know, often a television company will say, "We don't develop games, so we're going to hire a game developer, and they're going to pay a certain amount of flat fee, maybe a success fee." And then they're kind of stuck with a bunch of code that they then right. have the responsibility to update, or they're going to be on this treadmill of making right. more Paying payments to do or updates. That's a really difficult proposition for a TV company to manage. Whereas if you've got somebody who's actually involved in building a new product and, and then has a stake in the growth of it, right. yeah, they're going to work. They're going to be working. I see you've got this section but up you know, here. I was, I was going to say, sorry, Robert, I was going to say your point's really interesting because games are a different beast to linear programming, obviously. And so one of the things that, that took a long time for me to kind of get broadcasters comfortable with is the idea that a game is something that lets users change the outcome. And often when we have narrative linear media, people really want to control the outcome. As much as they want to control the brand, they want this to be the result. You yes. can play whatever you want, but then it has to be this result. Games are really mostly fun for people when they can change the result. And that's mm -hmm. been a big, a big sort of hurdle to get over. But when people get that, then, then you can still honor a brand and honor the characters and the storyline. You just need to be able to let the users have the freedom to do that. And I think point. another fascinating point. thing about social gaming is it, um, there is not necessarily an end. Right. I, that was so <laughs> yeah. shocking because TV people are so focused on the, on the, the climax and the right. end. And then it, a lot of it is about creating a perfect world, you know, right. in your own universe. Well, you're right about that. I mean, look, a game experience, a good game experience is architectural. People can wander around yeah. in it right. and discover things. And, you know, architects definitely are control freaks and they program the experience. But right. what they're not going to do is tell you how to use it or what to do. They Precisely. might stru structure the space so that certain things unfold at a certain sequence. That's great game design. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's more like you're building a house or a stage and you let people go on and, and entertain right. themselves. Will, Will Wright, when he built SimCity, said it's not a game, it's a toy. And that was another interesting sort of revolution in the game design mentality. That's exactly what you're saying. There's no end to a toy. So I'm looking at this and I see this nasty word Gamification. I, I'm on the record. <laughs> We're talking about game design, and that thrills me. I, I could talk to you about it all day long. But right. I see this word on the screen, gamification, and I'm on record saying that it's an, not just an ugly word. It's an ugly concept. Right. So it's an ugly word for an ugly concept because, in my opinion, most gamification that we've seen so far is really a form of strip mining the best of a game. 
right. taking out the game mechanics and turning it into kind of an incentive or loyalty program that basically turns the audience into click monkeys where they're just kind of clicking their way through. Now, others might see it differently, and I know there are a couple vendors out there that are really pushing this concept. Well, tell me what your experience. Have you launched any kind of gamification on Bravo, and, and how uh, do you look at the We category? have. I prefer not to mention name <laughs> brands. All right. um, but I would say, I, we were talking before, that one of the biggest challenges I face, and if any of you are startup entrepreneurs, I think there's an opportunity in this loyalty rewards market. One of the problems is the idea of finding a loyalty system that's really sticky, that really gives you something more than a badge, and, 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 and is... Um, creates more usage and also could potentially be linked from a brand perspective to physical rewards. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, something you said earlier in the session was uh, you were focused on the, on the second screen stuff around something that matters. Mm -hmm. And I think we focused, when you make a game that's supposed to be fun unto itself, you have to make it matter. You have to make it fun for people to play it. You, you can't just give them points and they'll play your game. The game has to be fun. There has to be intrinsic yeah. value. That's right. And so I loved it when you said it has to matter, because I think if you start from it has to matter, and, and when you say rewards points, one way to start making something matter is that actually the points are good for something. Maybe mm -hmm. I can get a free Wi-Fi on an airplane, or maybe I get... But that's just giving the points value. They're still making an intrinsic experience. Actually, can you bring that slide back up? We were just, just going to use it as an example of what I'm saying. Oh, Bruno? Bruno, can we see the can slide? Can we have that slide back up? Thanks. Um, I just wanted to, to mention, this is... You're right. I... I <laughs> I'm embarrassed we have to use this word gamification. No, no, it's okay. it's one of those things that happens when the industry takes off with something that's rather crappy, but it helps you communicate to people what you're working on. Are you improving the concept, though? I, I think we've done a tremendous amount We know amount there's of, plenty of vendors right. out there that have this kind of hit-and-run game, gamification right. system that's just basically like clipping coupons. Yeah, add, add some badges to a site, you get a 5% or 10% engagement increase. I don't know how long that'll last. I saw a presentation where a guy showed all the badges you can earn, and it said badge measles at the bottom of it. And I think it is a kind of sickness, and it'll probably become so diluted it doesn't matter. What we've created is a system using cards, but you can use any metaphor you like, where the cards are things you collect that have real value and real content. So there's video in them, there's audio in them. They can unlock things on your site. They can unlock things in games. They're collectible in their own right. They can be compressed together to give you a bigger and better card, which can earn you points in those kinds of rewards programs. Cards can even be action cards that you can do to your friends. I could use a postcard on Robert, and it will post on his wall. And maybe it'll come from Bravo because I earned one special Bravo postcard that takes so much activity to actually get. But now what I'm creating is a social viral game around that rewards and engagement program. And it's not just how many badges or stickers do I have on my site. Cool. It's actually something I want to play. So you're putting the game back in the gamification. That's, that's the idea. I love that. And then you can redeem those cards for you know, discounts on DVDs or whatever it is you right. want. Yeah. All right, so we covered a lot in just a few minutes. We talked a little bit about how to use social media to engage an audience, but it's not just about engagement, right? It's also about driving the ratings of the program back up. And Lisa shared a couple of great examples about how to do that. And Nathan told us about how a TV company or a media company can actually activate their brand in a way that's gonna generate revenue on Facebook, something that very few companies have been able to figure out how to do. And now finally, this section has been about driving loyalty and engagement in a way that retains that audience, maybe helps you migrate that audience from platform to platform. We have time for a couple of questions. I want to make sure we don't miss those. Are there folks out there in the... Oh, Stuart, again. Very quick to raise your hand. Build a TV show, or whether it's Bravo having a format and saying, why don't we debut this on Facebook as a social game, build an audience and then bring it back. Is I that happening? Is that uh, I don't think it's happening, but the, in case you wouldn't hear the question he's asking about, could you do social games the other way? Number one, when we're launching a social game with Real Housewives in the, in the summer, in which it's sort of, I think the next level of transmedia is fan co-creation, where, you know, the fan, so you watch the show and then whatever happens to the show is going to occur in the social game, and then you can become a part of that life. So my number one agenda, truth be told, besides monetizing it, is to grow the audience and potentially reach gamers to come back to Real Housewives. Mm. So... Of course, my ultimate dream is that, of course, we're a digital test bet and that we would help lead in that direction. Um, and we've done it once. We have a, a TV show called Watch What Happens Live that started as an online talk show that was shot in our conference room um, with the head of um, production named Andy Cohen. He's now become a full-fledged TV star, and he has an on -air, his on <laughs> own on-air show every single night, the only uh, show in the U.S. that's sh shot live um, every night at 11.30. Um, so we've had a... 
one experience of that, but I think, I, of course, I dream of doing more, but, um, and I think social gaming gives us a lot of opportunity for that. My girlfriend's going to be so mad that you're doing that game without, <laughs> that I missed the vote on that one. There was another question back here. Yes, sir. Hi, Lisa. Um, I work uh, with a transmedia production company in the UK, and we're always trying to uh, convince broadcasters uh, that it's, there's value in um, in the stuff that surrounds the, the, yeah. the television program. Um, they want that stuff, but they don't want to necessarily pay for it. Um, the, the, the problem we always have is how we actually can demonstrate whether it's through... Um, discussion online, uh, the sort of metrics that you would use to maybe convince uh, the people in your team um, that it's actually worth investing more in yeah. the digital side. How, what's, the, what's the kind of, um, you said about the report, for example, that you did for Bravo, what's, what, what, what would be the kind of things you would look at and target to try and convince well, I um, mean, broadcasters? I, I think, uh, like everything, you have to, what I found in the experience is you have to do it first. So I found the proof of concept system first really helps, e.g. you just have to go out and do it first and, and try it. So, and I also would try, if you notice the first two transmedia experience we did, one was on video and one was on social gaming, both which was heavily metric based. So I think that's easier. I find we do a ton of innovation in sort of emerging platforms, which a lot of it involves sort of voting and on-air two-screen experiences. And sometimes those metrics can be harder to track. So, um, you know, I think for transmedia, our success has been, and we haven't we've only had success with one so far, we hope with a second, has been, been going something that's very easily tracked. Video was super easy to track and very easy to sell at a high CPM. Great. Well, I think that's all we have time for, I'm afraid. We have, uh, um, I want to thank our two guests, uh, Lisa Shaw from Bravo Media and also Nathan Gunn from Social Game Universe. Thank you very kindly for thank joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert.